Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome all. Wow, what a wonderful turnout today on this beautiful Saturday morning. Thank you for making your trip out here. And uh, first, I want to just uh, talk about a little bit logistics. You see, we have two exits over here, and obviously the uh, entrance that you came in through. So in case of emergency, those are the places you go, but we prefer you run over to this way because the fairgrounds that way and uh, we're supposed to go to an assembly. So this is the new uh, fire safety announcement. Uh, restrooms are through the doors uh, to the back, make a right, and then the set of uh, restrooms are to the left. Uh, this session is being recorded, so uh, take notes all you want, but we will also send a copy of the recording to your uh, registration email account. And for those who register, there are another about 200 of them who do not show up yet. Uh, they will also get this video. And uh, I want to thank the volunteers for helping put this uh, event together. Um, we have DC and uh, Mira in the front doing the registration. Nancy, who's our whole program coordinator, so she oversees all the educational programs. And then uh, we have uh, Brandy Rader, who's a staff, uh, who's also been assisting us. And of course, we have our wonderful, fabulous instructors here. First is Peggy um, Hammercourt. Peggy has been a Fulbin County Master Gardener since 2003. She was certified as Events Trained in Earth Kind Landscaping in 2015 and enjoys sharing her Earth Kind Landscaping knowledge with the others. She's a past president of the Fulbin County Master Gardeners uh, from 2016 to 2017 and currently serves as the president of the Fulbin County Agricultural and Horticultural Advisory Committee. She lives in Richmond area with her husband and enjoys gardening for wildlife, especially for birds. She is graduate of the University of Houston with a bachelor's degree in business and enjoys the uh, career in HR in the oil and gas industry. She serves as the president of HR Houston in 2001 to 2002. <laughs> and our second speaker is Ken Ingrott. Uh, Ken has been a Fulbin County Master Gardener since 2016. He has a close relationship with the soil since birth, growing up one of the nine siblings in a small farm community in Northwest Ohio, where his family tended a large vegetable garden. He was employed for 37 years with the Phillips Petroleum Company and Chevron Phillips in various locations in Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, work functions include chemical research and development, catalyst plant te technical management, and product development for the specialty chemicals division. He received a BS in chemistry from St. Joseph's College in Russian's clear? Rensselaer. Rensselaer, thank you. Uh, Indiana and PhD in chemistry from the Ohio State University where he met his wife while he, she was getting her chemical engineering degree and who is also now a master gardener intern, so this is contagious. And uh, apart, for those of you who are interested in joining Master Gardener's program, we do have our annual training program and we start recruiting usually uh, in the uh, um, uh, summer and uh, the program starts in the fall. And uh, so to finish up, Ken also and uh, his wife has three children and eight grandchildren with, uh, who are sometimes helping out with their large gardens in the Richmond area, so pass on the torch to the next generations. Uh, I'm Angela Chen. I am this year's um, program coordinator for the Grow Your Own program, and uh, I've been a master gardener since 2019. So welcome, and without further ado, Peggy and Ken. Thank you, Angela. And thanks everybody for coming. Boy, the room has filled up since I was last up here looking around. That's great. Well. How am I standing? Am I good for you? For your yeah, good. Okay. Well, that's me, Peggy de Hemacourt. The name is French. I married it. You can pronounce it any way you want to. <laughs> <laughs> if you're from France, I'd love to hear you pronounce it for me because I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Um, I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about edible garden planning. And what I'm going to share with you, the information I'm going to share with you is basic stuff. It's pretty simple. Some of it's even intuitive, right? But that doesn't mean it's not important. Um, 
Your success in edible garden, gardening depends on these things. You should have a plan. Remember that if you don't know where you're going, don't be surprised when you get there. <laughs> you have to choose a good site. You have to prepare the soil. Uh, you have to plant varieties that are suitable for the area in which you're growing, this geographical area, for example, here in Portland County. And you have to be willing to provide continuous care to that veggie garden plot, right? Taking shortcuts on any of these items can lead to disappointments. And after you put a whole lot of effort and sometimes a little bit of money into doing this, you don't want to be disappointed. So I'm going to be talking about most of these things today. I'll, talk, I'll touch on all of them. Planning starts with understanding what your goal is. What do you want? Do you want to grow fresh fruits and vegetables for your family? Or maybe do you want to grow enough vegetables to share with the neighbors? Maybe you want to even get bigger. Do you want to grow enough vegetables to donate some to the food bank every week? You may have some personal goals that you need to think about before you set out to create your edible garden. And then what about family? Do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? Do you want to engage them in the process? Or is this something only you want to do? Maybe your spouse isn't even interested and you're just going to be the only one doing it. Important considerations when you get, get around to designing the size of your garden. And lastly, maybe you just are tired of mowing grass and you'd like to have something much more interesting in that backyard, right? <laughs> something that can produce food that you can bring to the table. So think about your goals as you set out on this journey. Begin by asking a few questions. Who's going to be doing the work? Yeah, I said work. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean you're going to be spending hours every day tending your garden, but you're going to have to have your eyes on that garden at least once every day. I'd say once every day. you got to get out there. You've got to look around. How does it look? Does it need water? Every now and again, you've got to fertilize. Maybe you have some weeds coming up you've got to pull. So depending on the size of your um, your garden, that could take a little bit of time every day. So if it's just you, maybe you want a small garden. If the whole family's going to be involved and will get out there with you, your lives will be much, your work will be much easier to accomplish with more people. So think about who's going to be doing the work. And then ask yourselves, what do you and your family like to eat? Trust me, don't go to the nursery and pick up a cart and visit the veggie section because you may be putting one of everything in that cart <laughs> because, you know, the bug gets you. You know how it is when you shop for plants. I'll worry about later where I'm going to put it or what I'm going to do with it. I've never eaten this. I wonder what it tastes like. Well, let's take one home. No, think about it in advance. And this could be fun if you have children or grandchildren. Everybody could make a list of what they like to eat from the list of vegetables we can grow here, for example, and you could prioritize some things and, and make, it a, make it a project. Don't waste garden space on things that nobody's gonna wanna eat. And then think about how you plan to use the produce from your garden. If you just want a couple of fresh tomatoes ready to eat every day of the tomato production season, you don't need but a couple of plants, two or three plants for a small family. When they start producing, you're going to have tomatoes for your sandwich, tomatoes for your salad. If you want to put tomatoes up, if you want to process them for canning so that you have tomatoes to use all year round for your pasta sauce, you're going to need a whole bunch more tomato plants and maybe different kinds of tomatoes. So think about how you plan to use the produce from your garden. And then think about how much usable space is available. This is really important. Um, and here's what I mean. You want a well-drained area. If you've got a low spot in your yard, don't put your garden there. You need to be, you should be near a water supply. The garden's going to need to be watered. And if you don't have 
a, an automated system set up and hooked up into your water supply, that means you may be dragging hoses uh, back and forth throughout the hot summer months, and that takes some of the fun out of being outdoors. So try to position it next to a water, near a water supply. Try to make it visible from the house. When something's out of sight, it can be out of mind. You know, you may not be going out there and peeking and seeing what bugs are eating what plants today if you don't see it. And I can speak for this uh, uh, personally. It was last summer, I believe, when one morning in the kitchen, while well, I don't know, maybe I was doing the dishes after breakfast, looking out my kitchen window, and I could see across this rather large yard to my small vegetable garden in the back. I looked up and suddenly I thought, what? It's gone. It's like my vegetable garden had disappeared from the kitchen window. I had been growing okra that was this tall. And so, you know, I dropped the dishes and ran out to the garden to see what had happened. And best I can tell, deer had munched them right down to the ground. And my garden was gone. <laughs> so uh, nothing I could do about it at that point, but um, I was glad I could see it from the home. And when you when you see your gardens from your from your windows, you know you you want to wander out there and see them and take care of them. Usable space means making your garden away as to the extent possible. Keep it away from trees and shrubs and buildings. That's because trees and buildings can cast a shadow on that garden and you need as the next point says, you need at least eight hours of direct sunlight uh, during the summer growing season for sure. The other thing is trees and shrubs have, or especially trees, have root systems that extend well to the edge of their canopy and even beyond. You may think you're not putting your garden where it's going to compete with trees, but those tree roots will seek out that lush garden soil that you're putting compost in, that you're keeping watered. Maybe the rest of your yard isn't getting watered much, but those tree roots know how to find those nutrients in that, that water. So they will grow into your, your, your bed if you're not careful. And lastly, of course, sunlight. The fruiting vegetables that we grow in the warm season should have at least eight hours of direct sunlight every day. You can get by with less in the cool season when you're growing more root crops like carrots um, or, or um, beets or leafy vegetables like lettuces. Uh, they, can, they can get by with maybe six hours of sunlight. But for the summer crops, you need at least eight. So that's what we mean when we talk about usable space. <coughs> Sunlight is important, as I've mentioned. If you're just getting started and you're wondering where should I put my vegetable garden, you need to think about your house in these kind of terms. Okay, you've got your house and you've got fences that are gonna cast a shadow during certain times of the day. You have existing trees that are going to cast shadows. Your neighbors probably have existing trees that are shading part of your yard sometimes. And then you've got to figure out your directions, your north, south, east, and west. Um, and remember that the sun is lower in the sky, in the southern sky in the winter, than it is in the summer. So these patterns of shadow will change throughout the seasons and throughout the day. But if you observe it for a while and sort of think about it logically, hopefully you can find the spot where you can get enough sunlight to have a successful vegetable garden. So planning really means planning, which is to say, put it on paper. Uh, if you own a house, you probably have something in your file that looks something like this. You might have gotten it at closing that's an easy way to start. You can take this and reproduce it into a very basic design of your property so that you can see something drawn to scale. And then you can add your existing landscape features. This is, um, this is a real life um, 
example, a master gardener friend of ours. This is his house, and he was contemplating where or how he could grow vegetables. And he has this beautiful place. I've been to his house. Uh, this is the backyard. Uh, this is a wrought iron fence. This is an open area, so he's got not a neighbor behind him, but lots of open space. It's very attractive. But look, he had a tree here, a tree here. He had planting beds here and here with ornamentals in it. And so his challenge was, well, how can I work in a vegetable garden? Well, he could take out trees and he could put, a, you know, a squarish raised bed here and one here if he wanted to. And, and notice what, what's on this one. We flipped the, flipped the chart for you, but his morning sun's in the front, his afternoon sun's in the back, which that's good for your backyard garden. You're going to get lots of sunlight back there if you don't have trees. So he could do that, or maybe he could do two small beds and put a fruit tree over here. Or maybe he could do one big bed and a fruit tree. Well, my friend decided he wasn't going to dismantle his yard. He was going to leave everything just like it was. But what he figured out in going through this exercise was this space right here between his air conditioner unit and the back of the house on the southern exposure, he was able to create a very small planting area right up against the house that got just enough sun to enable him to grow just a few things that would make him happy and feel like he was bringing something to the table. So uh, if you can go through this exercise on paper, uh, it would be very helpful. So most of us homeowners uh, practice what we call intensive gardening using raised beds like you see in this picture. Compare that to more traditional gardening. Maybe your grandmother did this or your next speaker does this so he can tell you all about it. Uh, gardening in rows. And um, one of the differences is that there's a lot of space that's not utilized for planting in these rows, and it takes up a large area. Intensive gardening says use a smaller space and try to maximize every square foot of that space and have something productive growing in it. It's, it can be done, and that's kind of the concept of, of raised bed gardens. So when you build a raised bed garden, um, you need the frame. You need to build that frame out of something. And this is an example of building it out of wood. You don't want it any wider than about three to four feet because you don't want to have to walk through your garden to maintain it. You want to be able to maintain it by reaching in from all sides and getting at things. But it could be as long as you wanted it to be or that you had room for. And you want the sides to give you about 8 to 10 inches of depth. And if you put more than one in, or even if you put one in around other structures in your yard, be sure to leave maneuvering room. Who's going to put that lawnmower, get that lawnmower around the bed, or walk around with the weed eater? Or maybe you think about the wheelbarrow when you have to bring in some compost to add to your bed. Make sure you can maneuver around it. <coughs> And you'll, you'll likely want to remove the existing vegetation. You can do that manually, mechanically, or chemically using herbicides. But whatever you do when you're finished, uh, think about suppressing what's left of that vegetation with, with cardboard. Great use for your Amazon boxes, right? <laughs> we all have them. Um, so if you lay these cardboard pieces down and overlap them by about six inches and let them stick out on the side, before you add your garden soil mix, you'll keep that grass and weeds, you'll, you'll suppress them. They won't be growing up in there right away. Now eventually the cardboard's going to disintegrate, it's going to decompose, and that's okay. And eventually your garden bed soil and your, your lawn soil will be one and uh, you'll be in business. And then when that's done, you're gonna add a garden soil mix. Now you can buy garden soil mix 
at the nurseries in bags. You can buy it from soil yards and have it delivered in bulk. Um, there are lots of types and brands out there. We don't recommend any particular kind. Um, but if you are shopping, look for something that's marketed as a vegetable and herb garden mix. Typically, you'll, you know, if, if it's if it's formulated for vegetable gardens, it'll say so, or the seller will tell you that it is. This is you're not going to put topsoil in there. This is a special mix, you know, just intended for uh, edible gardens. And you're going to fill up that raised bed planter and leave about two inches at the top so that you can mulch it. And you're going to have to check and adjust for fertility from time to time. And Ken's going to tell you all about that when he follows me in a few minutes. So, we found our spot, we built our bed, we filled it with soil, and now you get to plan what you want to plant. This is an example of this intensive gardening I'm telling you about in raised beds. This, for example, would be a four by eight foot plot. And look at the bounty of things you can grow in this space. Um, you might have a couple of tomatoes, maybe four squash plants, a couple of eggplants, some peppers, some bush beans, maybe a cucumber on the trellis, and uh, some radishes. Uh, yes, ma'am? Well, I noticed that the tomatoes have a lot of space, so what's that normal space you put around your tomatoes? Well, they'll come with some recommendations. Um, in this case, it's, what is it? It's, it's a, two by two. Two by two, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. thank you, my brain. So, so that people, one, tomato one tomato plant, yeah, one tomato plant. If you're growing anything on a trellis, like the cucumber that is in this example, be sure you're not, your trellis and your cucumber isn't going to shade something. So where you position it relative to the sun will be important. So this is just an illustration of what you could put in a garden during the warm season in a, in a pretty modest four by eight foot, foot plot. Lots of stuff that you could be bringing to the table. But here's another look at the same thing. I've colored it to give you an idea that you don't put all these things in at the same time. So the garden you just saw wouldn't exist in March yet. You would be putting your tomatoes in in March and maybe your bush beans, that's the orange color. Uh, in April, you might be putting in your squash and your peppers. Uh, in any time from March to June, you could be putting in your eggplant. And notice the radishes are red. You, you probably planted those back in February. So in your planning process, not only do you need to plan for the kinds of food you want to eat, but you need to think about succession because when the radishes come out, maybe in March, you've got a space that something else can come into. And uh, when the tomatoes are finished in the heat of our summer, that might be July, and they've just sort of given up, then you've got space to, you need to be thinking ahead, what can I come in with after the tomatoes are finished? Uh, that will carry me on through the fall. So there's lots of planning. And the planning is important, especially, you know, you can usually get what you need plant-wise at the nursery because they take good care of us. They have the plants that we need because they want to sell them to us. But if you're going to start from seed, you would need to plan ahead and order your seeds, you know, from a reputable seed source so that you have those seeds in hand when it comes time to put in anything you're going to direct seed or maybe start from seed indoors in the wintertime. So planning is about what, it's about how much space each thing needs, and it's about um, rotation or succession of, of crops. Here are some examples of the density um, that different types of plants, that's the wrong way to put it, but. Um, how much space different plants need. You know, if you have a square foot, you could plant 16 radishes or 16 carrots, and you can see on down the line, those are small plants. 
but at a square foot, you might only put one cabbage or one broccoli or one cauliflower, etc. And then plants that grow vertically, um, you know, you could put a lot of pole beans if they're growing up a pole, but you'd only put one tomato. And that tomato may need more than one square foot to, to really be able to, you know, spread its, it spread out. So I mentioned uh, timing of planting things. This is a busy chart, but you can get it if you want it. Go to the Fort Bend County Master Gardeners website. That address is FBMG for Fort Bend Master Gardeners org. And there's a tab at the top of the page that says Article Library. And under that Article Library tab, you'll find this vegetable planting uh, matrix uh, that tells you when to put things in. The green lines are the ideal planting times. The red lines represent, eh, you can do it if you want to, but you know, it's kind of on the margin for that particular uh, vegetable. And when you, if you go to this website and get this, you'll also see there another uh, PDF file of recommended garden, recommended vegetable varieties for Fort Bend County Gardens. Uh, those recommendations are based on plants that we've trialed here in our demonstration gardens and plants that our members have grown successfully. So take advantage of those resources. Now, if you go through this exercise and you decide, I don't have space in my yard for a garden, Try container gardening, and just about anything can be a container garden, right? Of course, if you don't have room for a raised bed, you don't have room for a boat in the backyard, you need to garden it, but you get the picture. Um, as any container, as long as it has good drainage and it's large enough to support the particular plant that you want to grow in it, can work. And the beauty of container gardens is you don't have to worry about that sun problem. You can move them around your yard, you know, to be in the sun, depending on when, where, where the sun is moving and how the trees are leaking out. So here's an example. If you wanted to grow a tomato in a, in a container, you'd want at least a five gallon container. And you see other examples there. On the small side, if you had one gallon containers around, you could grow some few carrots, some beets, some lettuce. So there are possibilities here. Even if you have a raised bed garden, but you're not growing as much as you'd like, start some containers. And as I said, any well-drained container can be productive. And here's some good examples of things that people have done in their backyards. How cute is that? Now, when you grow in a container, you're not going to use garden soil for your growing medium. You're going to use a lightweight potting mix. There's a difference between potting mix, we call it potting soil, but it really isn't soil. It's just a mix of things to plant in. Garden soil is too heavy. It's not going to drain well. You'll find potting mix at your nurseries and garden supply places. It's appropriately labeled. It won't be hard to find. If you wanted to make it yourself, this is the recipe that you'd use. You'd use one part peat moss, vermiculite, or perlite, and one part coarse builder sand. Now the thing to remember about potting mix is it's not fertile. Your soil is fertile. Your garden soil, you're gonna, you'll hear more about this when Kim talks, you're gonna be amending that with things like compost and the like. But uh, when you grow in a container, in a potting mix, you have to fertilize. And the recommendation is to use a slow release fertilizer, a balanced one, such as 14, 14, 14, and just apply it to the, to the uh, container size. Follow the directions. And an ex a, a brand name example of a slow release fertilizer that you may know is Osmocote, but there are others. Now, you know, vegetables aren't the only 
edible things we can have in our yards, you might be considering fruit trees as well. Um, the important consideration for fruit trees is to know their mature size and to know how much space they need. Um, Nancy Chef was telling me before the uh, talk today that she's got an apple tree in a pot. And it should have been in the ground by now, but she can't figure out where to put it. And so she keeps moving it around the yard and letting it be where she thinks it might go and watching it. And then things are complicated because her kids wanted to put in a pool for the grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you get into to garden. You have competing interests. But, you know, trees need space and your, gar your veggie garden needs sunlight, so you're balancing that thing, right? But maybe some of you would prefer to have fruit trees than vegetable gardens. So it's, it's a personal decision. And if you lack space for a fruit tree, some fruiting trees, like lemons and limes, are suitable for, for growing in large containers. Um, um, when I say large, I mean large, like a whiskey barrel or a 20 gallon container. Gotta be well draining, same, same rules as container gardening. Well draining potting mix, so slow release fertilizer. The thing about fruit trees, though, in containers is you pretty much have to, if, you're, if, you, if they bloom for you and they set fruit, it's recommended that you thin that fruit down considerably because the, the contained tree can't support all the fruit that it wants to produce. So you're, it's hard to do, but when those little fruits are small, you know, you take some off so that you're not stressing the tree. And then every couple of years, You've got to take it out of the container, or it's recommended that you take it out of the container, and give the roots a slight pruning. They will have grown to the edge of the container, right? And the tree will start to be stressed. So you take it out, turn it on its side, pull it out, prune the edges of those roots some, so that when you put it back in new potting soil, there's space for those roots to keep growing and expanding. And uh, when you do that, you also do a little pruning of the canopy to sort of balance the canopy with the roots. It's not hard to do, but it's, it's something to do. The benefit of container citrus is um, that you can move them indoors when a really serious freeze is predicted and, and keep them. Yes, ma'am. Let me get closer so I can growing in a container. The question is, can, should you do that with other container-grown fruiting trees? I believe you said you had a mango? Yeah, for example. And I suppose the answer is yes. I mean, the I don't personally know about mangoes, but eventually you may see your tree underperforming for you, and that could be the reason why. The roots have completely consumed that container, and uh, it just needs a fresh start. But maybe but when we get to the end of this presentation, I'm going to show you something that I want you to um, take to heart, and I'll mention it now. The, I've been a master gardener for 19 years, and I know a lot of stuff, but I don't know everything. We fortunately staff a hotline, as we call it, Monday through Friday any of your gardening questions, whether it be about problems, advice, the kind of question you just asked me about, you know, growing a mango in a pot, 
you can call in and ask your question. You can email us. You can send us pictures of things. And Master Gardeners will research the answers for you and get back to you with recommended advice. And at the end of our program today, I'll share with you um, that number and that address. But basically, it's our website, fbmg.org. So I've given you kind of a, I'm not sure, answer. So if you're concerned about that, send it to our hotline, and people who are smarter than me will, uh, will give you a good answer. Thank you. Okay, so that just takes me to the end of my section here. And just a reminder that, you know, everything turns out better, right, when we begin with the end in mind. Other questions, Pablo? Why do vegetables have to be on the raised bed? Can it be on the flat? The question was, why do vegetables have to be on a raised bed? Well, our clay soils are pretty heavy. They hold water longer than you would like them to. Just like when you build your landscape beds, you build them up a little bit so that the water will drain when we get those four or five inch rains occasionally. If the vegetables are sitting in soggy soil, clay soils, they will not be happy. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. My first question is, please explain the difference in the usage of vermiculite and perlite. And then to use them. And then the second question Excellent point. That last, the last point she made was that I didn't mention the last frost date and the first frost date when we talked about planting, and that's a very important consideration. The chart that we had, that we've made available to you, takes that into consideration. Um, you know, planting, some of you may have tomatoes in the ground, I do. I've planted them already. We could still have a freeze. I'm hoping we know. I'm willing to have to replant them if I have to. But uh, yeah, March 1 is typically close, close to the 1st of March, maybe, is when we expect our last frost. And our first frost, I think, is expected around middle of December, December 13th, something like that as a rule. But uh, if you follow our planting advice, um, it's, it's premised on that. Now the second question she had had to do with vermiculite and perlite, when to add them. And I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I've never added either one to, I've always, I've personally always purchased potting mix and I've replaced it with purchased potting mix and it contains one or the other or both. So I have never personally added either one and don't have any particular knowledge about that. Um, I know that both of them are minerals and they are heated at very high temperatures which expands them and they help with moisture holding capacity, at least one of them does, and drainage. So when, you know, they're, they're larger particles that help water drain better so that your roots aren't getting waterlogged. But as to how, to, how or when to add them to fix a problem, for example, I'm not sure. But call our hotline if you'd like. How am I doing? We have more questions, but I don't. It's 9:40. We were going to finish. Eight minutes. Hmm? Eight minutes. So we have nine to ten thirty is what yeah. this is supposed to be. Okay. I'll take a couple more questions and let Ken get started, and then we'll come back with questions at the end. Okay? This young man, Henry, right? Yes. Is drainage important? To, is drainage important to the soil or to the plant, or both, is my question. <laughs> Thank you. You should see Henry's pictures. He's got, he's just made a raised bed, two raised beds at home. And he's into this, he's planted. Um, drainage is important to the plants. The roots need air in order for the plant to live. So if your soil is waterlogged, the roots can't breathe. Just like if you went underwater and needed to take a breath, right? So roots need, you know, plants' roots need moisture and they need air. And our soil 
has a good soil should have a good mixture of both air spaces and hold water long enough for the plants to take it up when it needs it. Is that good? Okay. One more question. So I don't want to jinx anything, but yeah. you've got tomatoes in. Uh, lots of us probably have tomatoes in. So if a freeze should come, what would be your advice as to the best way to survive the, the frost mm -hmm. or the I've known if your tomatoes are really small, if you've got some five-gallon buckets, you can turn it up, turn them over on top of those small plants and get them through the night. Okay. That should work. Okay. We shouldn't have a prolonged hard freeze at this point. Um, yeah, let's hope not. Okay. In the interest of time, I want Ken to get started. I know some of you had your hands up, and when he finishes, we'll take some more questions. He may even answer some of your questions and just talk about soils. I'll refer him to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Jennifer Hoffman. I'm from Lincoln Park. Yeah, we do have a good crowd. Okay, so, um, soils, and we'll get right into it. So here's an outline. What is soil? Physical characteristics of soil. Improving soil structure. Soil water. Plant nutrients and soil pH. Fertilizers and soil testing. So at the end of this, if people are interested, we'll take whoever wants to go out. And we'll go out to our demonstration gardens. And I brought some tools to. Uh, show a different, couple different ways of how to take a soil sample. And towards the end of the talk, we'll be showing you the forms that you can fill out to send in the soil samples to Aggie's uh, soil testing lab, so we'll go over, we'll go over that. Yes? Uh, very exciting, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> All right, so soil, by volume, take a bucket of or a spade full of soil. What? What is in that volume of soil? So roughly 25, for a good soil, roughly 25% will be air, 25% will be water, in other words, the void space. Roughly 50% minus whatever organic matter you've got in there is minerals. That's the solid part. And we'll talk a good amount about organic material. Texas elevation map. Okay, so basically, as we all know, it gets high in the north and the west and gradually gets lower in the east and the south. That's the lay of the land. Rainfall. Yes? Can you see the little map? Okay, I'll try to. How is that? <laughs> okay, average rainfall around here, Fort Bend County, a lot, or somewhere in the mid 40s to whatever. A lot of a lot of rainfall. Talk to a, a guy in the crowd. He's a geologist. Who else are geologists around here? No, oh, I haven't hit the only one. So. Whoops, it is. So there's various different places around the United States and in Texas where, where they call parent soil. Where did the soil actually come from or start to come from? And there's many different geological formations we end up around here. I read a little bit about geology. I know nothing about geology. But apparently down in here is one of the most recent geological periods, the Quaternary or something like that. And uh, so it started two, three million years ago and is ongoing now. As it turns out, I grew up in Ohio, Northwest Ohio, and it's one of its big impacts on soil was the ice ages. And the ice ages, you know, relatively recently, you know, they started to recede, you know, 15,000 years ago or something like that. But the soil and the lay of the land for where I grew up was very much 
impacted by the Ice Age, Lake Erie and whatnot. They were formed by this massive amount of weight of ice coming down and grinding the rock and whatnot, and when it receded, leaving all this kind of pulverized stuff around. So a lot of different ways to start making soil. So what are the physical characteristics of soil? And we'll go, we'll go through some of these. Color, texture, structure, drainage, depth to the parent material like we just mentioned, depth to get to that parent material, and organic material. And, and again, I'm going to spend some time on this question of organic material. I don't know who designed this plot, but I think it's pretty interesting. <laughs> you know, your typical graph is X, Y coordinates and maybe a Z for the three-dimensional. This is not your typical graph. So it's meant to kind of uh, describe the various components of the mineral matter in your soil. And there's three different types of sizes of mineral particles that make up soil. So the three dimensions of this plot are if you go 100% clay, 100% silt, and 100% sand. Okay, so your, your soil is a mixture of those different types of particles. And by type of particle, we're meaning the size of the particle. So clay is particularly small, less than 0 0.002 millimeters. No way you're going to see that with your eye. It's got to be a very powerful mi uh, electron microscope or whatever. Silt is bigger, but still small, 0 0.002 to 0.5 millimeters, very small. And then sand, you can see with your naked eye, but it can get up to 2 millimeters. Now, in your soil or in your garden, you've got particles that are bigger than two millimeters, you know, chunks of rock and, or whatever, or maybe some comp or chip wood. Those aren't considered soil. Soil is uh, mineral, the mineral matter of soil is composed of these three sizes of particles. So, if you start from 100% clay and go down, to 0% clay, start from sand, 100% and go to zero, start from silt, 100% and go to zero. These fine lines in here to kind of define by 10%. And so if you go to these two stars, this happens to be around Fort Bend County, very high in clay content, more than 40% not good as far as drainage and that sort of stuff. It does retain water, but it doesn't drain very well. This is a more nice soil, basically less than 20%, less than 20% clay, about, uh, is that, uh, silt, so about 20% or so, 15, 20%, and the rest, and the rest sand, so sand, it, it, the problem with sand is, is if you have all sand, it's just going to drain the water out. It won't retain water. So you, you want a mixture. Unfortunately, you buy a plot of land and you don't have a, you, you can't dictate what it is, but you can put a raised bed or that sort of stuff in. Well, I can't see this very well. Uh, so we'll talk about soil, soil improvement, okay? You can improve it with, uh, improves landscape water retention, encourages natural balance and fertility, decreases pest and disease pressure, and so much more. So this, I like this quote. It's easier to adjust a soil's fertility, in other words, its chemical composition, what the roots take up, than its, than its physical properties. You know, lady asked about vermiculite, perlite, and that sort of thing. So trying to add the soil to get its structure different, but it's very difficult. It's, if you're putting in a raised bed, it's a lot easier to just start with the, the good stuff that you purchase. And I'll show you some of my beds. I was lucky to go into a place that had some 
you know, reasonable Brazos River and so on. Okay, structure. Aggregation of minerals and, uh, I mentioned, organic matter. So, soil is produced when unmathered geologic material is acted upon over time by climate and biological activity. And I'll talk some about this biological activity. It, structure varies widely, depending, as we mentioned, on clay and organic matter and the amount of cultivation or tillage. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention. I forgot. This texture is wholly dependent on the mineral content or the size of the mineral particles. It has nothing to do with the organic matter. Structure, texture, tilt, that sort of stuff. That matters with organic matter. But the texture, by definition, is just these three different sizes of, of mineral particles. So soil aggregates, rounded or jagged, raise in size from a match head to a large pea. And as I said, Soil structure is almost always improved by adding organic matter. Okay, we talked about parent soil or parent matter. We talked about minerals. We talked about organic matter. And the question is for the roots, for your plants. What are they going through? What are they in? How are they going to absorb nutrients? So if you look at a, a nice soil, the top, let's see what we got here. Oh, there it is. Boy, I can't hardly see it. Can you? There you go. So a good soil, it's got nice uh, organic matter. They're kind of separating the mineral particles. The tilt is good. The roots can go through the opening, the air. Uh, in the water through the pores and it can go down quite a good ways until it gets towards the parent material that's maybe partially cracked but it impedes the growth of, uh, of the roots versus a compacted soil it's difficult for the uh, roots to, to make much headways to, keep, to go down so we can start absorbing uh, minerals this is just a picture of kind of a platy, you know, compact soil. Peg talked about, try not, if you can, try not to walk on your uh, soil uh, to press it down. I remember growing up in Ohio where, you know, farmers had these big, huge tractors. Well, you go into the land and you uh, compact it. So, I mean, as a gardener, you can try to avoid that. This is just a demonstration of, of the ability of water moisture to, to kind of find its way down deeper and deeper into the soil. So you can do this test. You put a water bottle with a little punctured hole in there and let the water uh, gradually seep out of it. And you can just kind of visually see where the, where the water goes and how fast it goes where it's going. In a clay soil, the, uh, it'll kind of sit on the top, it'll uh, alleviate, it'll kind of spread out and, and as it's trying to work its way down. So it takes longer for the soil. <coughs> Excuse me. It takes longer for the... Uh, boy, I just can't... Oh, I made my fingers in the way. Gee, wow. <laughs> So it takes longer for the soil or the water to, to get down. It spreads out more, so it might take 48 hours to get down you know, several feet versus a good soil, sandy. It doesn't spread out, doesn't alleviate so much. That alleviates it down quicker. Just a cross section of a good and the bad or not so good soil. And you can't see this, but this is in feet. This is in feet from zero to six feet. 
and, uh, for a good soil, you know, quite a ways down for nice organic matter versus a not so good soil. You can see this bleached whitish area, you know, where a lot of the stuff has been eluded out or eluded dot down and not too much organic matter at all. So I mentioned about organic matter. Very important. I remember again growing up in Ohio. You know, farms, several hundred acres, you know, basically thought back then, I mean it's maybe still this some. Um, every year you go in and you plow it up and you disc it. And uh, but you deserve your soil, <coughs> excuse me, a lot like that. And, and it starts oxidizing the organic matter and uh, faster than what it needs to be. So the organic matter loosens it, aggregates the soil so it drains better. It's a nutrient source for plants, increases water holding, increases aeration. You need oxygen down there. Food for the microbes. I'll talk about some more about microbes. <coughs> I have. I've just been enamored with the microbiology of soil. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I, I know so little about it, but it's amazing. Uh, uh, buffers, the, micro, the organic matter buffers pH, and I'll talk a little bit about pH. It helps regulate the temperature and helps prevent erosion. Okay, so what's the difference between Humus. I gave this talk a few years ago and I was saying hummus. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know who was came up after the after the talk and said, I think it's humus. I must have been into chickpeas or something there. <laughs> Anyways, humus. If I say hummus, uh, just laugh, you know what the heck. So what is humus? It's what's left after the decomposition of the organic matter. And it coats soil powders and gives dark soils that color. Organic matter, it's all things organic before it becomes humus. And it provides food for microbes and worms. Okay, so I talk about these microorganisms. All the critters that are still living include microorganisms, Bacteria, fungi, yeast, nematodes, oti, and macroorganisms. Earthworms, pigs, snails, whatnot. This, uh, again, I've just become enamored in the last few years. These microorganisms that can extend huge, huge area. I mean, they're, they're, it's a network. It's a, it's a microbiome. One of my son-in-laws got me really interested in the microbiome of my gut. Yes. And uh, your microbiome in your gut is really helping you digest all this food that you're putting down in your in your mouth. I mean, it's crazy. And so, the, the there's I don't know if I got this here. Oh. I've read different things. Some people say in a tablespoon of soil can be over a billion microorganisms and. In a pound, there can be like, you know, several hundred billion of these things. I mean, it's, so, I, you know, when we're going to take a soil sample, I'll show you. When you send that soil sample in, you're sending a lot of microorganisms to the lab, basically. They're getting a free ride, so. It's, it's amazing, the microbiome. I, like I say, I'm still enamored with it. Okay, uh, a little bit about fertilizers. And adding fertilizers, adding fertility to your soil. Fertility is the chemical stuff that roots take up so that they can grow. And there's slow release and there's fast release. And slow release is just as you would expect. You add it here and it may take, you know, several weeks for it to finally be depleted. I mean, things are growing during this time. 
but it spreads the release of that fertility of those minerals over a longer period of time versus a fast release. It gets in there and starts releasing and things want to grow real fast, but it, it gets depleted quick. So, you know, you, there's, you know, I think maybe it's the next slide. Yeah, you can buy mixtures of fertilizer that are uh, mixtures of slow release and fast release. So if you want to get your vegetables or whatever off of a fast start, some of the some of the nitrogen will be present in uh, what they call water and soluble nitrogen. So it'll take more time for the for it to be attacked by the microbes and gradually the water to release so that the soil. Uh, uh, the, the plant's roots can take it up. Okay, fertilizer, nitrogen, organic versus inorganic. For uh, nitrogen, which is the biggest thing that, uh, that is, you know, if you look at a package of fertilizer, it's three numbers, nitrogen, potassium, a phosphorus, excuse me, and potassium, NPK. And usually the, the one with the biggest number is nitrogen, if you buy a balanced or a mixed fertilizer. But if you're just focused on the nitrogen component, you can buy a, an organic thing, which I do. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why uh, here in a little bit. And here's different sources of nitrogen. And you'll notice that poultry is particularly high in phosphorus, which I'll allude to in these different stuff. And then you can buy uh, synthetic forms of nitrogen that are soluble that the plant roots can take up. Ammonium sulfate, etc. Another uh, classification for soil is pH. I, I have this little thing. What is this? <laughs> My head is oxygen. These two are hydrogen. That's water. Okay? That's water. Now what happens for just a very minute part of water molecules? What happens? A proton, a hydrogen, leaves the water molecule, and you're left with this proton. It leaves its electron here, and all you've got is this proton here, and this fighting to see what it can do it ends up attaching itself to another water molecule. But pH is a measure of how many of these protons are, are out there, whether they come from water or they come from acid, <coughs> like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, vinegar, you know, anything that's got a lot of these protons that they want to release and to go into the water. pH is a measure of how many of these protons are, are flying around or attached loosely to something else. Too low a pH is a, is a high acid condition, not good for, for plants. And it, it's a logarithmic scale, but it, it, it's just a way of measuring acidity or basicity. <coughs> so, seven is neutral. So even in pure water, there's a little bit of water that's dissociated. Okay, so plants need about 16 different nutrients, some of which are macronutrients more important than others. They are released, you know, humus is made by the microbes, the microbes uh, help release the minerals that are in the organic matter. Those minerals are, those organic matters are mineralized, they're made into the soluble types of minerals that the plant roots take up. But the ability of these different, whoops, the ability of these nutrients to be absorbed by the roots 
it's affected by the pH. So pH in the range of 6 to 7, 7 plus, that's the pH range that is the most amenable for the, uh, the various elements, minerals, to find their way into the roots. And let's see, what does it say here? Not only, not only can increase the levels of organic matter, stabilize your pH level, but the increased microbial, microbial activity due to our increased organic matter can help release the tied up nutrients. Again, organic matter is really important. Soil sampling, everybody's doing it. No, not everybody's doing it. I'll bet you, I didn't do it until 2016. I took the Master Gardener class in 2016. So I'm going to show you, over the course of six years, the evolution of some of the beds in my garden uh, and the importance that soil uh, sampling and testing was for me. And uh, when you came in, you could uh, get some of these, uh, get some of these bags to uh, put samples in. And, and again, after at the end, if you're interested, we'll take people out into the garden and show you how to take samples. Uh, I wanted to point this out. This is, you can go online to here, soiltesting.tamu.edu. And it's got all sorts of information about uh, how to take samples, like we're showing, the form that you fill out to get your soil tested, uh, and how you specify what you want tested. And of course, it's a range of the, the most basic uh, analysis requests for the basics, and it costs $12 if you ask for it to be emailed to you. Results. If you want it mailed, it's another three dollars. So, again, it's all shown on, on the forms. Um, maybe I'll show you here. So, there's a couple ways of taking soil samples, and we'll do them out there if you want. So, one is to dig a little a hole with a spade, and then take a slice from the side of that hole, about an inch thick, and that's that slice. Then you can take a slice off of here. So you end up with an inch by an inch thing, and that you can put into a bucket or something like that. And you end up taking you end up taking several of these samples uh, so that you can get a representative sample of, of your area. Got this from my neighbor. This is what she uses to take a soil sample. Just a little, you know, not even an inch diameter, and you just push it into the ground and take it up, and then you can push the soil out. So you're trying to go down six to eight inches when you take your sample. And you get to take several of those samples, put them into a bucket or something your gloves on and mix it, get it really nicely uh, fine, and throw out little rocks and whatnot that are not really representative. So again, you can get this form. Uh, we've got samples here, or you can get it online. But basically, uh, put your name here identify what it is so what I'm going to show you is my west vegetable garden that's what I put here west vegetable garden here's the different types of requests you can make basic to more involved so you pick up you pick what level you want and you put that up here whoops your contact in through your phone and your email where you want your results sent uh, and you say what you're drawing, very important, because when they do the test and they're going to say, okay, here's what he's drawing, or she, this is what they need to, to 
get your soil in a f optimum fertility level. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else. Oh, check that for your email. Here's again, you can't see this, but here's what I uh, sent in and the results from the. Now I, I retired at the end of 2015. At that time, I had six rows, three, three foot wide by 20 foot long, raised, not raised, mounted beds. And I wanted to expand it to nine. So uh, I added three more rows and I took a sample of that mounded dirt before I had any, added any fertilizer or anything to, as a base case. Again, I did this because I was taking master gardening classes and they told me about the importance of taking soil samples. So I did that and here's the results. It wasn't too bad actually. I didn't request organic matter analysis. pH was 7.5 high, but it needs to come down. Phosphorus was below the critical level, but not too bad. Potassium, small addition recommended. And here's where they give recommend, they tell you based on the analysis of the different metals and minerals. And here's a bar chart from low to high. They'll tell you how much nitrogen or potassium or phosphorus to put in to get you back to a, a more amino. And, and they do say that when they, people send samples in, a lot of times it's in the late fall, early spring because people are getting ready to put their garden in. And uh, so the, the turnaround is a little slower at that point in time than it is, you know. But you want to take a sample before you've added all your stuff, not after. And nitrogen needed a small amount, but it wasn't bad. Okay. So here's that same three new beds, 2020. Three years later, I'm, I've, so I've, been, I've been working this garden for three years, uh, and this is the fall garden, fall winter garden. You can see uh, sugar snap snow peas, and uh, we mentioned, um, Peg was mentioning about terracing and that sort of stuff. What I do for my sugar snap snow peas is I just grow them where the tomatoes had been. Uh, on the cages, so I just need cages up and they just can grow on that. And here's some onions and lettuce and that sort of stuff, more onions. So again, I've got a lot of space, but I've got a lot of grandkids, so I like them to have a lot of room for them to walk around and whatnot. And this is just shredded bark from uh, the arbor company when they come in and trim the trees or chop up the, and uh, put it on the roads. This is drip, uh, drip of, of, of drip, irrigation. When I put the garden in, um, Adam intercept one of the sprinkler circuits and it's all drip now. Two hoses go feed each row. And these are just mounted, mounted beds. And one thing I was going to mention is I don't turn these mounted beds. Every time I'm going to plant, I'll just poke holes down into the mound, six, eight inches or so. You know, press it down with my foot and whatnot to aerate the soil. I don't turn it over. I just aerate it so that the moisture can get down in, the air can get down in, feed and water those microbes so that they can chew up the stuff and get the roots going. So I sampled this bed uh, after growing for three years. <laughs> Not too good. Uh, I, had, I had added the uh, most of those years, purchased compost uh, chicken uh, manure, compost. But the last year, I had started my uh, compost bed, and I had put into that compost bed some chicken manure uh, bedding from my, one of my grandsons had an FFA project, and he was raising chickens in his garage. And you know, all this hay and or straw, and I, I put it on my compost. Well didn't give it enough time to really get chewed up. So or, or organic matter is good, pH was down good, but very high phosphorus, about more than five times the amount of phosphorus that is recommended, really high. And the problem with that is, is high phosphorus can tie up some of your trace metals, magnesium, uh, magnesium what does it say? Uh, iron and zinc. So 
not only is it high, but it's tying up other stuff. Even though you may analyze those things to be okay, they're not free to get into the roots. Potassium was lower, similar nitrogen. So right here, they go phosphorus. Don't even think about adding phosphorus for five years. <laughs> I mean, in, that, in so many words. So that, and they act, I show you that website uh, where you can get uh, various literature, and one was on high phosphorus. And so I read that, and uh, yeah, so no phosphorus addition. So what I've been doing for the last three years is adding just organic nitrogen, the blood deal, and I've been adding organic uh, potassium. It basically gets a lot of different organic stuff, but to it's been added potassium sulfate. So, so it's a texture, it's a slow release, but the only phosphorus this is getting is whatever the, the compost, you know, put vegetable scraps and uh, leaves and that stuff. So it's getting some phosphorus from whatever compost, but I don't put any chicken manure in my compost ever again. So. <laughs> but I just started my uh, or just turned over my most recent that I age it, I build a, a compost for a year, and then I'll turn it over and, and where the old compost is gone, and I inoculated it with some cow manure, or from horse manure, from, uh, and it's not so high in phosphorus, so. but chicken manure is very high in phosphorus. Okay, so this is, uh, I sampled it again uh, a couple months ago, and it's, it's improving. Phosphorus is down now from, 100, from 243 down to 144. So I'm going to do what they said, no more phosphorus for another two years. Yeah. And, uh, and so this is not bad. Uh, so, and again, I'm supposed to add one pound of nitrogen per 100 or about square feet, some potassium, no phosphorus. And then uh, some sulfur if I want to. I actually put a lot of ground coffee grounds in my compost, but my wife and I drink a fair amount of ground coffee, so that helps lower pH a little bit, but not as fast or not as good as sulfur. Yes? So with coffee grounds and with tea, I drink a lot of organic tea. Yeah. Can it raise the acidity too high if you don't? No, I mean lower the pH, raise this. No, my, I've been adding it all the time, so I don't, and I think it can help with the texture, I think. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, is this your compost soil? No, no, that's that's those raised beds that I showed you. Yeah, this year, uh, actually, I ended up having the same stuff in those three beds onions, and uh, but there was one of those rows that I didn't have anything in, so I, I sampled it. I hadn't had any added any fertilizer since the, the last fall crop, so yes, have you found that coffee grounds has increased the amount of critters? Well, good critters or bad critters? <laughs> because for me, you know, I don't like rabbits and skunks and armadillos and that sort of stuff for sure. But a lot of those bugs, yeah, I don't know. What, I'm, I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. But I know earthworms are good, so uh, I can see. You can also kill some bugs on accident that are really good for you. Oh, you bet, you bet, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? Say that. I'm sorry. What? Would it be wise to get your compost tested? Yeah, actually, the some of the material does indicate that. Uh, I'm kind of cheap, so. Uh, but uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure. Uh, well, if it's really good, decompose. My first, level, my de uh, compost is. I'm still learning how to get it really, really crumbly yet. So one thing is I don't turn it enough, you know. So. Yeah. But yes. Definitely. Okay, I wanted, to, uh, in closing, I wanted to give you some uh, content uh, references, and you can come up here and look at them if you want. Um, so when you take the Master uh, Gardener class, you get a big binder, and this is mine from 2016, the sixth edition, they've updated to 20, uh, 2019 edition, which my wife's got. But it's got a lot, of, a lot of different chapters in there, and one's on soil and that sort of stuff. Uh, another reference was the presentation I gave in 2020. Uh, 
Oh, the Fort Bend County uh, Vegetable Conference is held every year. And it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a mixture of uh, commercial farmers, uh, people that service commercial farmers, pesticides and that sort of stuff, that they're getting their continuing education requirements. But, you know, people um, uh, like us, uh, home gardeners. So that was good. I went to that again this year. Building soils for better crops. Uh, just to show you. Oh, really a lot of good information in there. Oh, <laughs> and then this one is the last one, Bob Randall's year-round vegetable gardening for Metro Houston. So, some really, actually my uh, wife gave this to me for when I retired uh, at the end of 2015 and just got some autographs in there from my daughters. And, uh, so, very personal book for me. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, when you were raised beds, did you kind of start with news, soil every year? No, not every year. I mean, buy some really good soil. But add, add compost to it, uh, yeah. And when you're adding, how much do you know how much to add? Is it like, is there a formula like so much? Well, I'll, uh, when, if you go out to the gardens, the, the vegetable gardens, just Wednesday, we uh, applied the new compost okay. to, the, to the top and for like a couple inches. Okay. And then you, work it in? you can right where you, you can, but you can just let it there. I noticed what one of the ladies did was, we put all the compost down, and then they actually sprinkled some slow-release fertilizer on the top and watered it in. So you really don't need to work it in. It'll get worked in by the time you grow and that sort of stuff. But you can. <coughs> Anybody else? I think Peg's got a few more slides, and then uh, you can come up, or you can, you can get the forms and, uh, and go out there. And then Peg, I think, is also going to show you some of the vegetable garden beds out there. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll we'll be a, we'll be. Hang on. It's on. We'll be um, when we go outside. We'll continue answering questions, and we'll I'll hang around as long as you want to to answer questions. So, just a few more slides to cover. Um, I mentioned the hotline earlier. Uh, this is. Um, you can email us, you can phone us. If anybody faxes anymore, you can fax us. <laughs> That's interesting. It made me think. <laughs> uh, and um, here's our website. And uh, there's a real good, my go to uh, uh, internet source for information about home landscaping, including vegetable gardening. Gardening is Aggie Horticulture. This is Texas A&M AgriLife Extension's website. And it's much of, much of it is built for us homeowners who are just trying to get things done right. And on aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu, there's a section on vegetables, and there's an easy gardening series. And all of the crops that you might want to grow are listed there, and there are PDF files on each one that talk about the crop and how to grow them. And, what to look for. So check that out if you want to. This is the second of this year's Grow Your Own series. You've got your bookmark this morning. Uh, next month we'll be talking more about uh, warm season vegetables and herbs, uh, setting up raised beds and planters, follows in May. Then we'll hit up the cool season vegetables and herbs in August. See, August, it's not too soon to be thinking about your cool season stuff. <laughs> and then we're having a class on composting. We've heard a lot of comp about composting this morning. So if you're interested in that, uh, come on in. Nancy? Mm -hmm. The, the question was when the city or the county comes around with spray trucks and sprays for mosquitoes, is that the situation? Is that harmful to your to your vegetables? And I don't know the answer, but check with our hotline. Mm -hmm. Ask that question. I don't know. 
it's not happening in my sort of rural backyard, so I, I have not had to think about that in a long, long time. The only thing I've noticed a lot of the springs and things is they feel that it's steps. Depends on what they're spraying, but yeah, when you just, there, there's a whole science uh, or, or, or an earth kind practice called integrated pest management that you might want to study up on on Aggie horticulture. And the premise there is reach for the chemicals last. There are lots of things we can do to avoid using chemicals and still keep pests under control. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Lucy over there has a box with um, bags for taking soil samples. Okay. People with homeowners. Okay. In a minute, when we go out these doors to the veggie garden, you can pick up the soil sampling stuff if you'd like. And I think I have one more slide. If you haven't already bought your vegetables for this year, the Master Gardener's Vegetable and Herb Sale is next Saturday, the 11th. Yes. Right here in this very room. <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, nine to noon. So come, come join us, yeah. I was curious about edible weeds. I, I thought I noticed some um, uh, lamb's quarters out front in the bed. Is there anyone that can help me identify what, you know, so I look at a particular uh, one of it. I've been picking dandelion greens all through my yard. Good for you. I, it's <laughs> certainly not anything I would trust myself with. <laughs> you, you're asking if anyone's here? That, yes, okay. that would be able to. Well, if you're identify. smart about edible weeds, See the lady in the pink cap. <laughs> I think that's the last slide. Yeah. Oh, not the last slide. And we have another comment. Before you get out of here or get crazy, please give us feedback using this survey form. It's very important to us to know what you thought about today. It helps us help you better in the future. So do that and then. We may have another question, and Kim wants to make another comment. So, your question, sir? Uh, how soon will this be available, what you're taking today? We how, think a week. How rapidly can we watch it? One week. We think one week. One week is Maybe the answer. Or generally a week, you'll get an email with the link to what we showed you today. Yes, ma'am? I haven't missed the fruit tree one. Um, is there a way that I can get that one? Because I didn't get an email on that. It's on the website. If you'll go to our website, uh, under that tab I told you about earlier, there's a there's uh, print media and video resources. It's something like that. You'll see links to the videos that we've done before. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Oh, uh, hello. I just wanted to have a a plug for the Master Gardener program. So, all over the United States, there are Master Gardeners. And the Master Gardener program started a long time ago. Um, and it's associated with land-grant universities. So Texas A&M is a land-grant university. Well, as it turns out, I went to Ohio State, which is a land-grant university. The Ohio State University. <laughs> and as it, as it turns out, I've got a first cousin that's a master gardener in the county that I grew up in in Northwest Ohio. And I've got a very, very close friend from work, Philip Spicholi, who worked at R&D for many years. He retired in Richmond, Virginia with his wife where she's got family. He took master gardening classes with their land grant university. So look into it. If you're into gardening or, for me, retiring at the end of 2015 and moving away from People that you knew, and, to, and we moved down to Richmond a few. Uh, you, and so I didn't know a whole lot of people. Coming into a master gardener environment, volunteering, whatnot, it was very beneficial to me. Thank you. Well, as we conclude, thanks for being here for one thing. Um, but we don't want you to go home too soon if you don't want to. We're going to go out these doors. You can go with us. Right behind us here is the master gardeners. Uh, vegetable demonstration and teaching garden. Ken will demonstrate soil sampling and we'll be around to interpret what we're doing out there for you if you want to mingle in a garden on this beautiful morning. Thank you.